The anime started with our MC named Kai Sakura Vento, who looks at the chained up girl and he wonders if she's a demon or an angel. The girl asks him for help, but Kai can't believe that she would ask a human for help. Humans and other races have waged a fierce war against each other. This girl doesn't seem to know that and Kai becomes frustrated because no one seems to remember what the real world is like. A look back shows Kai doing the normal thing he does where he monitors a graveyard. His friends want him to hurry up, but Kai takes it very seriously. In this world, there are five distinct races, the demons who are wielders of mighty magical powers, the celestials who are demi-humans such as angels and elves, the spirits who are creatures that possess special kinds of bodies such as ghosts, there are also the mythical beasts that are colossal fierce monsters such as dragons, then finally there are the humans. A war waged between the five races and it's incredibly important to make sure that another great war doesn't occur again. Kai belongs to the Urza Federation and it's their obligation to observe the graveyard where the demons have been sealed away. Kai observes the graveyard for 300 seconds like always and determines that nothing is strange so the demons are properly sealed. Kai's co-worker Ashuran High Roll can't understand why Kai takes his job so seriously but Saki Miskati points out that it's good for them because they can take it easy. Demon has not escaped from the seal in the past 100 years, but Kai reminds his co-worker is that it's still their job. There are four graveyards around the world, and Kai points out that the people in charge of those take their jobs just as seriously. That's because if a demon were to get out it would be a catastrophe. His friends wish he would take it easy because the demon hasn't broken the ceiling sometime but Kai just doesn't want to let his guard down, and he declares that watching over the graveyard is his duty. A while later we watch as Kai just some training. But he has warned that a low-ranked soldier like him using a mythical beast for training is incredibly dangerous. Kai fights it anyway, but he finds that his attacks don't work against it. Saki gets worried so the hologram is deactivated and she wishes Kai wouldn't push himself so far. Kai thinks it would be pointless to train though, if he didn't risk everything. Saki actually kind of admires his determination and she thinks that if he were alive during the Great War, his name would have gone in the history books. Kai would be like the prophet named Sid, but Kai can't see himself winning against a certain four heroes like Sid did. Saki describes each hero from each of the four races and she couldn't imagine what they would do if they were still around. Thankfully, Prophet Sid was able to defeat them using the shining sword given to him by a god named Arsala Salaka. There is plenty of evidence that the four heroes existed, but there's actually no proof of the prophet Sid. There are no pictures or videos of him. Saki changes the subject as their friend Jean is being promoted and she wants to celebrate. Jean is getting transferred to headquarters at just 17 years old and she is the youngest person in history to be selected. She's an elite among elites so they have to get her more than a bouquet like Ashuran suggested. Just then Kai received a message from Jean and Ashuran reads it out loud. Jean wants to meet with Kai but she wants him to keep it a secret from Saki and Ashuran. Kai tries to cover it up by saying that the message isn't really from Jean but it's too late. And Ashuran wonders if Kai has a secret relationship with Jean. The friends try to get more information, but Kai just decided to go for a run. The next morning, Kai meet with Jean and he's glad to see that she's on time because she is usually late for everything. She wonders why Kai isn't wearing such fancy clothes while off duty, so he explains that he just came from the morning self-training that he does every day. Jean has him accompanied her while she does some shopping, and she explains that she's looking for gifts for Saki and Ashuran. She knows that they're planning to get her something, so she wants to give them something in return. Jean says that she probably will never see them again, but Kai is sure that she will be back as a cadet after her transfer is over in two years. Jean predicts that they will have finished their service in the military by then and they will be civilians. Only herself and Kai will likely still be in the military. Kai agree with her, but he can tell that she is upset. He knows what's wrong and tells her not to worry as he is sure that she will surpass her father the Urza headquarters chief. The two continue enjoying the day, but Kai doesn't pay much attention to what Jean is shopping for as he is looking for something for himself. In the end Jean thanks Kai for helping her pick out some good gifts. The two then discuss how Jean's father took Kai to inspect the graveyard when he was 10 years old. He wandered into the graveyard and when he came home he told everyone how he saw Sid's sword. Kai has a memory of what it was like inside the graveyard and how he almost touched the shining sword. This was the day when Kai started talking about how important it is to make sure that the demons don't escape from the graveyard. Jean wonders where they will be in the future but Kai points out that she will simply be back in two years. That isn't what she meant though, as she is talking about after that. 
Jean wants them to make a promise for the future, but Kai begins to panic as something strange begins to happen. Jean has no clue why he's behaving so strangely, so Kai begins to wonder if he's the only one seeing what's happening. Jean continues to talk like nothing is happening, but Kai is horrified as she is sucked up into a black hole. Just then, a mysterious voice announces that the world reincarnation has been activated, and it's time to execute the overriding of the world. Moments later, Kai snaps out of it to find himself in a dark and destroyed world. He is then startled with a gigantic and terrifying-looking demon appears before him. The fearsome beast uses a magic attack on Kai, and Kai just barely manages to survive by using his sword case as a shield. Kai can't believe that a real demon is standing in front of him, and it prepares another powerful-looking attack. Kai rushes to his sword and quickly loads some bullets into it. His weapon is pretty diverse as he's able to fire bullets from it and he cancels the demon's magic. The demon can actually speak, and it is shocked by Kai's cancellation ability. Kai explains he has modified elven bullets that are created using elven magic. The demon just continues tacking, but Kai shows his incredible fearlessness as he closes the gap between himself and the demon. Kai's sword is unable to penetrate the demon's skin, but he uses the opportunity to fire a shot at point-blank range. The exhausted Kai explains that the bullet he just used was the modified Drake bullet that reproduces mythical beast breath. It was his first time using it, but Kai is glad to see that he's able to move just like he does in training. This victory has made him confident that he can actually fight real-life demons. Just then, another demon appears and states how laughable it is that a human thinks that can defeat demons. Kai is impressed by how well the demon speaks human language. But the demon explains that the most effective way to give orders to a slave is by using its own language. Kai doesn't understand why the demon is calling him a slave, but there is no time to think. The demon says that Kai smells dangerous, so he prepares to eliminate him. Just then, someone rescues Kai by using a flashbang and they get away. This girl tells her group that the wanderer has been secured and she has to know where Kai is from. Kai is shocked to see that this girl is Saki, but she has no clue how he knows her name. Kai reminds her that they are friends, but she has never seen him before and neither has Ashurin. Kai can't understand why they don't remember him, so he reminds them that they are from the same agency, they don't know what he's talking about, and they explain that there are simply soldiers of their resistance. Kai is now the one to be confused, so Saki goes on to say that they're with the human rebel army. This just causes more confusion, so Kai asks them to tell them everything about this world. Ashurin and Saki assume that he's just flustered from facing a demon, he must have forgotten things so they try and help him remember. They explained that there was a great war of the five races and humanity lost. Kai is shocked of course because in his world humanity actually won. Ashurin goes on to say that they lost the war over 30 years ago and cities around the world were taken over by the four other races. As for the humans, they're barely managing to survive while running and hiding. The four other races now rule the world and they fight each other over territory. Ashurin and Saki then introduce Kai to the human city called Neo Vishal. A group of humans took an underground space that was still intact and remodeled it into an underground city. The resistance protected people living there by fighting the four races. Kai wonders why the humans lost the Great War, but it's pretty obvious to Ashurin and Saki. They point to how powerful the demon he just saw was and explain that they attack humans in groups and the humans don't stand a chance at beating them. Not only that, but each of the races has a powerful boss that they refer to as a hero, and these heroes are incredibly strong individuals. All this sounds pretty familiar to Kai, so he wonders what happened to Prophet Sid, humanity's savior. Kai is shocked to hear that they have never heard of Prophet Sid, so he explains that he's supposed to be the human hero who defeated the four races. Ashurin correctly points out that if they had anyone like that they would have to live underground like they are, just then the main core arrives and Ashurin explains that there are several human cities around the world, there are resistance groups in each one, and there are overseen by the main core. The commander of the resistance is someone that has saved many lives, and Kai can't believe his eyes when this person turns out to be Jean, especially because everyone thinks she's a guy. Ashurin and Saki introduce Kai to the commander and they explain that his memory is a bit foggy. Jean begins to leave but I can't take all this and he stops her. He tries to remind Jean about who he is and how they were just shopping a few moments ago. Jean, of course, has no clue what he's talking about, and she assumes that he has her mistaken for someone else. Kai can't believe that she really doesn't know who he is, so he asks her why she's pretending to be a guy. 
Jean is shocked to hear this and Kai reminds her that she wanted to surpass her father as his daughter. A soldier named Fallon Yubikatasu stops him and Jean decides to just leave. Kai's new friends worry about him and tell him that he should get some rest. That night Kai looked through some historical documents and finds that the only records missing are those of himself and Prophet Sid. Just then Kai realizes something. If Sid never existed and humanity lost the Great War, then why did the graveyards is the only way the four races still exist? Then next day, Kai asks Saki talking about the graveyard she has never heard of them. Ashurin lets Kai borrow the car which upsets Saki but Ashurin says that it was just a reflex. Kai arrives at the graveyard and thinks about how this is his first time going alone. He's surprised to find that the blockade stone was removed and he goes inside. The darkness soon turns to light and Kai is amazed when he sees the shining sword sitting there. This proves to him that the legends of Sid must be true. Kai pulls the sword from the mantle and a loud voice gives Kai the world coordinate key and calls it the code holder. Just then a giant shining door opens in front of him and Kai hears a girl calling for help. Kai is shocked to see that he's not in the graveyard anymore and he goes up some large stairs. At the top, he finds a ton of chains being used to restrain just one girl. Her wings look like they belong to both demons and angels and the girl begs Kai to free her from the chains. The story continues. We see the girl says her name is Rinne, but Kai can't be sure as she passes out. Kai doesn't think she looks like a demon, so he looks for a way to free her. Kai warns that she better not attack him after he frees her, but he finds that he is unable to break the chains. A more powerful attack fails as well so he's out of options because he doesn't have another weapon. Just then Kai wonders if he can use the shining sword so he says the words code holder. This causes his weapon to start glowing and Kai is shocked to see that it transforms into Sid's sword. Using the sword causes massive damage and the chains are easily broken. The girl is freed but Kai is startled when she jumps away from him. She angrily screams for someone named Vanessa to come out and she declares that she hasn't lost to her yet. She thinks that Kai is a wimpy little ranked demon that Vanessa sent to defeat her. So she attacks and demand him bring out Vanessa. Kai managed to dodge her first attack, but her second one is terrifying. Just then Kai hears a voice say that the code holder can sever fate. Kai uses the shining sword and shocks the girl as he slices right through her attack. Kai even surprises himself and the girl demands to know what he just did. She still calls him a weak demon but Kai shows her that he doesn't have wings or a tail. Kai asked her to start trusting him so she apologizes. She has a serious grudge against demons which makes Kairi realize that she must not be one. Kai wonders what race she is, but she doesn't think that's important. She thanks him for saving her life, and she even apologizes for attacking Kai, but she begs him not to ask about her race. They introduce themselves, and Rinna explains that she doesn't know where they are. She was fighting Vanessa, and before she knew it, she was imprisoned in this place. Kai is shocked because Vanessa is the hero of the demons, and she is known as the Dark Empress. This means that Rinna is really strong, and she confidently declares that she could wipe out a whole army of demons. Rinna is amazed by Kai for canceling her magic, but they are interrupted when a monster appears. This monster sounds like a robot as it announces their threat level to the new world is determined to be the worst. They barely manage to dodge the monster's attacks so they decide to just run for their lives. Getting away proves to be difficult as the monster is able to teleport itself and it captures Rinne. Rinne then screams in pain as the monster begins to eliminate her and Kai gets furious at himself for just standing and watching. His frustration causes him to act so he told Sid that he will be borrowing his sword and his incredible attack frees Rinne. The monster stunned to see the forbidden sword and she wonders what it's doing there. Just then a portal opens and Kai and Rinne escape back to the world. Rinne expresses how scared she was and reveals that this is the first time anyone has ever done something like this for her. She was told by the celestials, the spirits and even the mythical beasts that she is not one of them. The demons were the coolest to her as they called her an unsightly abomination. This is what caused her to get into a fight with Vanessa. Kai can relate because no one remembers him and he feels like he's all alone in this world. Kai says that his world was totally different because in this one demons have taken over all the cities. Just then Rinne explains that in her version of the world that demons haven't taken over, just before her fight with Vanessa the demon started saying that the hero of the humans had just arrived. Kai is in disbelief as he thinks that this is Sid but Rinne doesn't know who he was. Kai is still relieved because Rinne seems to remember the some history he does. Kai thinks that they're pretty similar and Rinne just happy to hear that because no one has ever said that to her before. Outside, Rinne collapses and Kai offers to take her to the underground city. Rinne is afraid to go to a human city though because she can't trust anyone. 
Rinna does trust Kai though because he saved her life so she agrees to go with him. Back in his room, Kai thinks about how difficult Rinna made the trip back. She was able to hide her wings but she still stuck out like a sore thumb. She even tried to use magic right in the middle of the city but Kai can't blame her because she's surrounded by strangers in a strange place. Kai's weapon was reverted back to normal so he considers trying to change it back. He is interrupted though when Rinna needs help shutting off the shower. Rinna thinks it's really unfair how humans shower with such warm water because she used to have to shower in freezing cold lakes and rivers. A soft bed is something new to her as well. She did notice that the city on the surface was in ruins making it clear that the demons really have taken over. Kai has also determined that this world is a world where the results of the war among the five races is inverted. Rinna simply says that they need to escape this world and return to theirs with the correct history but Kai isn't sure there's a way to do that. In the middle of the night Rinna wakes up and wants that the demons have arrived. The city comes under attack and citizens are told to immediately evacuate to a shelter. It's an enemy race invasion and Kai emerges to see how terrifying things are. Kai knew that this version of the world was in bad shape but seeing how far humanity has been cornered makes him realize how dire the situation is. What's worse is that there is no one who can save humanity. Rinna hold on to Kai but he apologizes and tells her to let him go. He has realized that there's only one person in this world who can play the role of Sid and that is him. The demons continue to terrorize the city and all attacks against them fail. Saki is sent to get a more powerful weapon but she quickly finds herself in danger. A demon's about to eviscerate her but Kai manages to save her just in time. Saki is shocked when Kai tells her to use water against these demons and he explains that the water makes it hard for them to fly. Just then Ashurin is the one to be in danger as he starts getting turned to stone but Kai rescues him as well. Kai comes under the attack of two demons but he masterfully avoids danger and Rinne backs him up with a magic attack. Kai impressed by how powerful she is and she declares that she wants to fight alongside him. Kai's friends have never seen attacks like the ones Kai used so Kai explains that he came from a world where humans won the Great War of the Five Races. His fighting style and the bullets he uses come from that world. His friends find that hard to believe but they're interrupted when the report reveals that two demons escaped. This means that the demons were just scouting the city and will likely return with even more demons. They need to report back to the rebel army headquarters so they ask Kai to come with them. Kai is hesitate at first but his friends are assured that it won't be a problem because of how powerful he is. The headquarters is located in the royal capital. The royal capital was destroyed but this makes it the perfect location because the demons would never expect the headquarters to be in a place that was ruined. Kai then learns that Jean took over as the leader of the rebels after her father retired from an injury. Kai meets with Jean and the other leaders but they find it hard to believe that he's from another world where humanity defeated the demons. It's so unbelievable that some members get upset. Kai then reveals that in his world he was childhood friends with Jean and that is why he acted like they knew each other before. Kai mentions some names that seem to bother Jean so she ends the meeting. Later, Kai is told that Jean wants to meet with them again in secret. Kai's information on the demon's weakness to water was incredibly helpful so they might believe what he says if he continues to be correct. Kai then meets with Jean and she reveals that he was right. She is a girl. The only people that know she is a woman though are Fallon and a few veteran executives. It turns out that the names Kai mentioned earlier were the nicknames that Jean used for her father and grandfather. It's pretty convincing when it comes to Guy being from another world but Jean's still skeptical. Kai's knowledge and battle skills could be useful though so trusting him is worth the risk. Jean then reveals that she needs his help. They're planning to team up with the other cities to surround them repel the demons that try to invade them. If they succeed, then they won't have to abandon their city. Rinna fears ever retaliation will only draw more demons to the city. And if a high-ranking demon decides to show up then it could blow away the entire city with just one blast of its magic. Jean gets frustrated as she already knows all this but has determined that they have no other choice. Kai shocks everyone though when he suggests that there's only one demon they should be aiming for and that is the hero of the demons, the Dark Empress Vanessa. Jean can't believe that he's really suggesting that because Vanessa is an absolute monster. 30 years ago she wiped out the capital's defense force and occupied the government palace all by herself. Kai knows just how dangerous she is but he also knows that the only thing that's going to work on a monster like her is Sid Sword, the code holder because of how dangerous his idea is. Kai suggests that he and Rinne will be the only ones to fight Vanessa directly. He explains that in his world, a man named Sid defeated Vanessa all by himself. Jean wonders if Kai is able to do the same but he's just hoping so. Jean then wonders why Kai's doing all this for 
and he agrees that it sounds pretty crazy for him to put himself in such danger for a world that he doesn't belong to. However, Kai has given it a lot of thought. His friends thought so hard for their lives and he wouldn't be able to escape and return to his world if he didn't do something to help them. Kai goes back to talking about his plan and explain that demon forces are mostly deployed near the border because they're looking out for the other three races and not worrying too much about the humans. The demons near the royal capital likely only makes up for about 10% of the demon force. While he fights Vanessa he would like the rebel army to keep the other demons occupied. Jean is confident that they can keep the demons busy for a couple hours but she is sure that a lot of lives will be lost in the process. Just then Fallon reveals that behind the palace there's a private underground trine line that the royal family used as refuge. No one knows about it and Jean's father was the one that came up with the idea to use it against the demons. At the time, there was no one strong enough to fight the demons so he gave up on his plan. Jean's father likely did until Jean, because he didn't want her going through with such a reckless plan. Jean can't believe that Fallon kept this a secret and Fallon admits that she has found herself trusting on Kai's abilities as well. There is no time to hesitate as the demons are likely preparing to attack so Jean declares that it's time to challenge the hero of the demons and take back the Urza Foundation. As the group prepares for their mission, Rinna thinks about how much she hates all the races and how she hates herself the most because she's made of all the things she hates about the races. Kai is the only person that ever embraced her so she hopes that he doesn't die on this dangerous mission. The rebel army then heads to the government palace through the underground passage. While the main forces keep the demons occupied, the plan is to free any captives in the capital and to defeat Vanessa. Saki can't believe that the four of them have to be the ones to confront Vanessa but Kai says that they're the only people he trusts to back him up. This doesn't make Sake any less scared so Rina promises that she is strong enough to beat anyone other than Vanessa. If she ends up facing Vanessa alone then Rina declares that she would just self-destruct and take Vanessa with her. Ashuran fears that they will be detected by the demons but Kai explains that the demons are really only sensitive to magic. Humans don't have magic abilities so it should be harder for them to be noticed. Ashuran is so nervous that his hands are shaking but he knows that if they defeat the demons they will be the talk of the world. They will be praised and maybe even rewarded. After a long drive, Jean gives an inspiring speech to her rebel army. She points out that they have been fighting the demons for as long as anyone can remember and it's all been in preparation for this day. Jean declares that it's finally time for them to crawl out of their dark basement and have their voices heard. Everyone cheers in agreement so Jean leads the charge to the surface. There, Kai is shocked to see what the government palace looks like as it is forming with demons. One demon uses a magic attack but Kai has seen it before and he lands a counter shot. He is able to quickly finish it off but several more demons show up. Kai and Rinna signal to each other like they know just what to do and they use a powerful combination attack to wipe out a swarm of demons. Everyone is amazed by the attack so Kai explains that he used a bullet manufactured in his world to combat groups of enemies. Kai decides that it's time for him to look for Vanessa and he will start on the top floor of the north side. The north stairs have collapsed though and they will have the breakthrough templates of stairs on the south. Jean then gives directions to the other groups. Group 1 is in charge of making sure that no demons get into the palace and Group 2's job is to rescue the prisoners underground. On their way up the stairs, Fallon reveals that she didn't see Kai pulled the trigger on his weapon when he launched his attack against the swarm of demons. There is no way the attack could have come from his gun. So Fallon begins to suspect that Kai isn't telling them something about Rinna. Jean interrupts their conversation though and brings up how Kai will be challenging Vanessa one-on-one. -on -one. She hopes that Kai won't go back on his word and he assures her that he won't. Just then Rinna spots a little imp and it summons a large demon. This demon is clearly very dangerous as it attacks a guy in their group but Fallon springs into action to slice the demon's fingers off and she saves the guy. Fallon tells the others go ahead as you can easily handle this beast so Jean says that they will see her again at the top. Elsewhere, we see that the mission is going well as group 2 makes contact with the prisoners and group 1 fights off some demons. Back with our group, everyone gets worried when an attack is aimed right at Jean. Jean is completely unharmed after it hits her though and she explains that she is wearing elven armor. When it comes to magical resistance nothing is better. Jean tells Kai to go on ahead and he vows to keep his promise to defeat Vanessa. They leave and Jean declares that the demon's opponent is the Knight of the Sacred Light. Kai's group is now down to four and they put on some armbands that will keep the demons from seeing them. Rinna nearly reveals her secret by explaining that she was barrier magic on the sleeves but Kai stops her. They come up with a lie about how it works and just say that her facts lie and hide them. Just then a terrifying monster appears and Rinne reminds everyone to stay silent. The beast gets really close to them, 
but they are hidden by their sleeves and the monster leaves. Kai then tells Saki and Ashuran to wait in a break room. If it looks like Kai is going to lose his fight against Vanessa, then they will have to shut off all the lights so Kai and Rinne can get away. The group splits up, but an alarm sounds soon after. Rinne has no clue how they could have been found so Kai suspect that there must be infrared sensors in the building. A demon appears before them and he calls Rinne hideous for having strange wings. Kai shuts him up and demands to know how they were found. The demon reveals that it was Vanessa's idea to use the human surveillance system. He explains that Vanessa was actually pleased to see the humans invading and she is curious to know why they decided to end their lives this way. Kai wants this demon to take them to Vanessa since she is so happy about them being there, but the demon would rather have some fun himself. He prepares an attack and Kai is shocked when Rinne takes a hold of him. She tosses Kai to the side and tells him to go on without her. Kai refuses but she tells him not to worry. She promises to be right behind him and she uses her ice magic to separate Kai from the fight. Kai is furious but he has no choice but to keep going. The demon can smell every rays coming from Rinne, so he can only wonder what she is. Rinne explains that she doesn't even know what she is, but she does know that she hates demons. Rinne prepares an attack and declares that she just wants to be with Kai. If the demons plan to interfere with that then she will eliminate them. Kai reaches the top floor and he's greeted by the Dark Empress Vanessa. Back with Jean and her group is doing their best but the demon barely notices them and he calls them weak. One of his fire attacks does nothing to Jean and he's shocked to realize that she's wearing elven armor. Jean then changes her weapon into a long bow and the attack she unleashes does some devastating damage. The demon still can't believe that she used elven and angelic magic items because if they are used by humans and capable of magic then it will chip away at their life source. The demon mocks her for sacrificing her life but she puts an end to his life. Jean doesn't regret her decision at all because it's the kind of resolve a human needs in order to defeat a demon. Her sacrifice is also nothing compared to facing off against a demon hero like Kai is doing. Just then another terrifying beast were instant take Jean's life but Fallon arrives to rescue her. The demons know just how dangerous Fallon is, as they call her Dragonar. This situation outside is getting worse and worse, so the girls determine that everything depends on Kai's fight against Vanessa. Back with Kai, Vanessa reveals that she is a succubus. She offers to love Kai but Kai points out that the only thing she actually loves is slaughter. Vanessa mistakes him for the warrior that wear his elven armor but Kai explains that he is someone who comes from a world where his three claims her defeat. She refuses to believe that such a world exists and she is even more shocked when Kai tells her that humans were the ones that won the war of the races. This is this gives her a good laugh as the other races are far more powerful than the humans and she wonders who it was that defeated her. Kai says the name Prophet Sid and she begins to whisper things like she remembers some things about Sid. She says it's nothing though and just prepares for battle. Kai quickly cancels her magic and declares that she takes humans too lightly. His counterattack does nothing though because Vanessa was using illusion magic. She's impressed by Kai's weapon because it counters her magic and unleashes an attack similar to that of a Drake's breath. Her next powerful attack blows a hole right through the wall and she curses herself for missing because she was trying to avoid causing destruction for her fortress. Vanessa warns that she uses a blast that can destroy any race and wonders what he plans to do about it. She unleashes the insanely powerful attack and everyone around the entire palace can feel its destructive power. Vanessa declares that it's impossible to survive her attack. Only one of the heroes from each of the other four races can survive it so she wonders why Kai is still alive. Kai thinks about how it was all thanks to Sid's sword and Vanessa wonders where the sword came from. Just then Rene appears to defend Kai but he notices that she is badly wounded. Rene refuses to let that stop her though and she tells Vanessa to come at her. Just then a portal opens from behind Vanessa and the robotic sounding monster from earlier grabs her. Its name is Last Riser and she has determined that Vanessa has a high potential of influencing this world after hearing the name Sid. Vanessa realizes what's going on but it's too late as Last Riser has already begun to remove Vanessa's code from this world. Vanessa manages to break free from her restrainers and she turns the tables on Last Riser. Vanessa calls Last Riser a dog of someone named Alfreya and declares that someone like her can never take her head. Vanessa shows the incredible power of a hero as she says scatter and her attacked this massive damage. Last Riser just barely alive so she escapes back through her portal. Kai can't believe that this Vanessa was the hero that Rinna fought but something is wrong. Rinna says that the Vanessa from her old world was not as scary as this Vanessa. Vanessa can't understand why her wounds aren't healing but that isn't as important as finishing her fight with Kai and Rinna. The story continues. 
We see Vanessa prepares to eliminate our heroes, but Rene rushes to hold her, and she tells Kai to run away. She puts herself in a shadow prison with Vanessa, but Vanessa mocks her for thinking she could hold her back. Vanessa shows her just how fragile her barrier is by destroying it, and she prepares to finish Rene off. Kai rushed to rescue her as Rene tries to tell him to run away, but Vanessa just unleashes a powerful attack on him. Kai's body is now lifeless so Rene cries out to him. Rene sobs uncontrollably and Vanessa tells her that Kai is no longer alive. She wonders if Rene will try to give her avenge or attempt to run for her life. Vanessa mocks her more and she thinks she has lost the will to live, but she is stunned when Rene's wounds begin to heal. Rinna speaks with the terrifyingly calm voice and declares that she will never forgive Vanessa. Rinna goes through some kind of transformation and Vanessa is stunned because Rinna's chaotic appearance seems to be a mix of all five races. Rinna just tells her to shut up as she begins her attack and she manages to push Vanessa back. Vanessa eventually stops her though as she laughs like a psychopath and she tells Rinna that she should have used this form from the beginning if she had Kai might have been able to escape. Vanessa determines the Rene must have been afraid to show her true form to Kai and fear that he would have rejected her. Vanessa makes fun of her for being the furthest thing from a human and for being afraid of being called a monster. She then blames Rene's hesitation for Kai's death and Rene can't deny it. Rene regrets not doing this sooner but she knows that she can't bring Kai back. Just then Rene get very serious and she tells Vanessa that it's time for both their lives to end. She takes hold of Vanessa and puts a curse on both of them. Rinna explains that the droplets of blood coming out of Vanessa or drops of her life, and nothing Vanessa can do will stop them from flowing out of her. The blood will continue to flow out of them until both their lives end. Rinna declares that it's all over, but she becomes confused and collapses. Vanessa explains a curse is dependent on how much magical power its user possesses. Vanessa then reveals that she prepared the spell long before their haven't even started. This spell in pedantry magical spells cast by the most powerful races. Because Rinne is a mix of all the races, the spell effects are several times more. Vanessa praises her for lasting so long and pities her for not belonging to any one race. Rinne is completely defeated so she begins apologizing to Kai over and over again. Vanessa has heard enough so she uses an attack to end Rinne's life. She is utterly horrified though when she sees that Kai has somehow rescued Rinne. Kai thanks Rinne for holding on while he was unconscious and she wonders if she is dreaming. Vanessa points out that what no human could possibly survive after being hit by her explosive magic at such a close range, and Kai thinks about how he was once again saved by Sid's sword. Vanessa shocked to see that he wants to challenge her again so she tells him to know his place. She reminds him that he's just a piece of trash that got lucky, and he had to crawl back while Rinna fight for him. This backfires though as Kai declare that is why he must defeat her. Rinna risked to her life fighting Vanessa so Kai declare that he must show the same determination. Vanessa wonders if he has something up his sleeve as well, and she explains all humans she has fought proclaimed that they were show strength of the humans. However, they all turned out to be liars. Vanessa lists the heroes of each race and explains that she actually acknowledges them. However, when it comes to the humans there is no hero, Vanessa wonders if Kai wants to take this title, but Kai says that he has no desire to become humanity's hero. Kai does intend on showing her something so she wonders if he will show her the strength or potential of the humans. Kai says is neither of those as he actually intends to show her the spirit of the humans. This world has no hero for the humans but Kai would gladly be humanity's representative as he fights Vanessa. Vanessa is unfazed by his declaration and she summons an attack called the Devil's Planet. This thing is gigantic but Kai uses his sword to eliminate it. Vanessa prepares another terrifying attack but Kai contacts the others and has them shut off the lights. Humans don't have magic abilities so Vanessa can't sense them in the dark. But she can see Kai's sword. She launches an attack at it, but it turns out that Rinne holding it as a distraction. Kai appears behind Vanessa and declares that he trained ten years for this very moment. Rinne tosses him his sword and Kai says that the fight is over. Vanessa accepts her defeat and Kai slices right through her. Just then Kai is shocked as Vanessa begins remember who Sid the Prophet is. She remembers him telling her about how the world will be rewritten and she realizes now that this is what he was talking about. Sid called it the world reincarnation but this means that someone is behind it, someone reincarnated the world and Kai must find the being that did it. Vanessa thinks it must be one of the other three heroes, and she explains the Sid foresaw the stranger occurrence that was to happen in this world. She reveals as it actually interested this sword to her because it is the one and only key to correcting the alteration of the world. Kai is shocked because history says that she and Sid were enemies that fought each other relentlessly. 
Vanessa admits to fighting Sid but reveals that that isn't the whole story. There is a forbidden code hidden away in the world that Sid knows. It's called the Zero Code and it's a troublesome magic. Vanessa congratulates Kai for defeating her and she acknowledges the courage it took for him to let go his ultimate weapon. Vanessa commends his clever planing and acknowledges the powerful human spirit. Vanessa begins to disappear but warns Kai to be ready in case they ever meet again. She promises to fight him as a succubus next time and disappears. Kai is exhausted but he can now relax as Rinne tells him that he has won against the hero of the demons. It is announced to the other rebel groups that Jean and her army have retaken the royal capital and the defeat the hero of the demons. Kai thought that something happened to him and Rinne but in reality it's the opposite. Something happened to the world and they were the only two people who weren't affected. Rinne just wants things to go back to the way they were and Kai agrees. Jean thanks Kai for helping rebel army but she can tell that something is wrong. Kai just isn't sure if he would be able to defeat Vanessa if he saw her again, but Jean just wants him to celebrate his victory. Thanks to him the humans will be able to rebuild the city even better than it was 30 years ago. Jean will be leaving that responsibility to those for around 30 years ago as she reveals that she will be leaving Urza. She then explains that three federations were taken over, one by the Celestials, one by the Spirits and one by the Mythical Beasts. There's a rebel group fighting against each one and Jean will be working with them to deploy a large-scale operation. Defeating the hero of the demons will surely cause commotion among the other races, so Jean wants Kai and Rinne to come with her. With their help, she hopes to pull off what the humans in Kai's world did. Jean asks Kai fight alongside them so they can finish the Great War of the Five Races. She wonders why Kai is so silent so he explains that he's amazed by her. The Jean in his world was always ambitious but she also had a childish side to her. She would always talk to Kai about personal stuff and she thought about her presence to get her friends. Jean can't believe that the side of her exists and Kai promises to tell her more about it when they have time. Kai agrees to fight by Jean's side but he also asks for her support and his fight against the three remaining heroes. They both agree to end the war of the five races together and Rinna says that she will join just to be by Kai's side. Later, the troops still can't believe that they really took back the royal capital, with no sit around Kai vows and the great war of the five races himself, then he will find out who's behind the world reincarnation and set the world right. While later we watched Rinna runs from someone and some guy helps her, Rinna wakes up from this dream and we learn that our group is headed to another federation. Request for assistance or coming from other countries and Jean's humanity's hope right now. A look back to just before they left the capital, shows that a demon had appeared before them. She was upset that they defeated her sister Vanessa and she attacked Kai. Rinna stopped her and the demon explained that she just wanted to greet the humans. Her name was Hymeril and Kai wondered if she is stronger than Vanessa. Hymeril assured them that they wouldn't have one if she was around and Kai assumed that she was there to take revenge for Vanessa. Hymeril had a good laugh at this because while she does of her sister, her no longer being around means that she is number one. She got down to business and explained that if the demons decided to unite then they would easily be able to reclaim the world capital anytime. The demons are purposely letting them have the royal capital so they want to take a break from fighting. Kai saw right through here though and determined that the demons feared that further fighting we just need them vulnerable to the other three races. Heinmerl just offered to let them keep the capital as long as the demons were allowed to keep all the other territories. Kai agreed to inform the commander and Heimerl just asked Rinne to stop glaring at her. Heimerl promised to cheer them on but Kai knew that she just wanted them to all take each other out. Heimerl realized that she had been caught so she promised to defeat the humans one day. She warned them about the celestial hero named Alfreya and left. Back to the present, our group discusses how there will be facing the celestials. Celestials are elves, dwarves, fairies, and angels. They are more cowardly and kinding than humans and they create powerful magic items to use in battle. Demons are considered monsters but celestials are considered enhanced humans. Our group compares to find a rest area but Rinna senses that a mythical beast is above them. This is incredibly strange since they are still in demon territory. So Kai tells everyone in their convoy to move forward at full speed. The troops fired as the dragon but it just attacks their convoy. Kai and Rinne team up to use a powerful attack and they manage to scare away the beast. After the other troops are rescued, the entire army arrives at the rest area. That night, Kai tells Rinne that there's a 10-foot female soldiers, but she refuses to leave. Jean arrives and Fallon takes Kai outside to speak with him. She will stand guard outside while Kai stands guard inside the tent. 
Fallon fears that people will find out that Jean is a woman if she stays too close to her, so it's best if Kai is the one to be by her side. Jean will have to remove her armor to sleep, so she wants Kai not to get any funny ideas. Kai returns to the tent and he finds Rinne is giving Jean a massage, pretending to be a guy's pretty difficult, so Jean really takes a moment to relax. Kai still can't believe their dragon appeared, and he assumes that it was their discount the area after news spread about the demon's hero being defeated. Jean explains that they made sure the royal capital was well protected before they left, so there is no need to worry about them being attacked. Jean becomes very serious that she has something important to tell Kai, but this just turned out to be that she tosses and turns in her sleep. Moments later, Kai becomes really uncomfortable as he can't sleep with the girls clinging on to him. The next morning, Kai is exhausted and he just pretends like he couldn't sleep because of the stress of having to be Jean's bodyguard. It is announced that they will be crossing the border soon, which means they will finally have reached the IO Federation. Their destination is the Rebel Army's headquarters. In the city just outside of the IO Federation, Saki prepares herself with a weapon because it's crucial to strike first if they encounter Celestial. Their guns are more effective against Celestial than dragons, but Kai still remains Saki to take a deep breath before shooting. Humans and Celestials look pretty similar, so Kai tells her to be careful before shooting someone. Rinne shows some food she found but Kai wonders if it's poisonous. Rinne doesn't think it is because it just tickles a bit when she bites it, but Kai freaks out because that's probably poison. This isn't her first time eating them though as she once ate them in the elven forest. Jean explains that the food is there because of the celestial invasion, the human city was buried along with the elven forest. Just then our group notices that they're being welcomed by civilians. The IO rebel army advisor greets them and introduces himself as Zephan. They received the news of Kai defeating the demon hero and it has given all the troops a lot of hope. Zephan has some sort of passive Fallon, and he's surprised to have lived long enough to see her again. They then all had to see the IO rebel commander named Dante. He is a descendant of some royal family so he calls himself an emperor. Fallon knows all about this guy and she explains that he's very envious and suspicious and obsessive. Because of this, he sees Jean as a threat. Their group is greeted by the commander's assistant named Cubery, and she explains that she must be present anytime anyone wants to speak with the commander. Commander Dante complains about them being late, so Jean explains that they had to deal with the dragon. This rude guy doesn't want to hear any excuses, and he just gets right down to business. He knows that Jean's army defeated the demon hero, so he assumes that she intends on taking even more glory by steering his IO rebel army. Jean explains that the IO army requested her assistance, but Dante had nothing to do with that. His assistants called for help without his permission. Jean points out that the Celestial need to be eliminated and it doesn't matter who takes the glory. She offers some advice to Dante, but he gets insulted because apparently emperors don't need advice. Jean gives it anyway and explains that they won't be the ones who decide what honors are awarded after defeating the Celestials. The people will decide so all they can do is behave in a way that's worthy of respect. Afterwards, Zephan shows everyone on map of the uncharted territories that the Celestials reside in. They don't know where the hero of the Celestials is, so everyone is shocked when Jean declares that she will lead the search. Dante is clearly upset, but Jean still asks if she can borrow his army's elite soldiers. Dante mocks her for going to the front lines, but she explains that she's choosing to lend her life to those that are continuing to fight on this land. The troops are in awe of her but Dante is clearly not happy. That Rinne eagerly waits for dinner to be ready but the others wonder if the soup she made that will really be eatable. Ashuran starts talking about the assistant thing met earlier but this made Rinne feel uneasy. The next day, Jean and troops arrive at the elven forest. Back at base, Dante still thinks Jean is a man and he hates her reckless Jean is. Kubri of course agree with him by saying that generals should remain at the rear camp while commanding the army. Kubri tells the commander not to stress about Jean and his recklessness and Dante commands her for being his only proper subordinate. A while later, Jean returns to the base with enough information to create a map. With the scouting done, they can have a strategy meeting the next morning. Fallon is upset that Jean went on an expedition without her but Kai points out that she did it to give the trust of the IO rebel army. They have their strategy meeting the next day and everyone gasps when Jean reveals that they found celestial footprints near some petrol routes. She wants to explore the celestial territory again so they can plan an invasion strategy so she asked everyone for their cooperation. Rinne eagerly wants to fight some angels and elves but Jean warns against carelessly stepping into enemy territory. 
Rene agrees to wait, but she notices that she hasn't seen Kuberi around. Dante isn't around either, but Kai just assumes that it's because he doesn't care much about being on the field. Elsewhere, Dante is busy getting hammered and reading about Jean taking charge. Kuberi has a solution though and explains that Dante just has to achieve something greater than Jean. She hands him a note with what she has in mind and declares that if he is successful then he will get his glory back. Later, Zephin is shocked to hear that Dante is going to personally lead the soldiers into the elven forest. Dante says that he already has someone exploring the elven forest for him, but this is the first Zephin is hearing about this. Zephin fears that this will cause issues with Jean's rebel force, but Dante reminds him who's boss. Dante allows Zephin to join him, but instructs him not to say anything to Jean. Elsewhere, Rinne is hesitant to tell Kai something because she fears that it will cause trouble. Kai tells her is figured out already so Rinne reveals that she doesn't think Kuberi is human. In the woods, we see that a massacre just took place. Some elf are shocked because the hero of the Celestials has decided to betray them. He hates all the other races, but he also thinks that elves, dwarves, and fairies are not needed. The elf thinks that he has gone mad and then wonder who the monster is behind them. The hero tells them that they don't need to know because starting now he is severing ties with them. The story continues. We see the elves are so shocked that they can't move so the hero attacks them. He freezes the elder elves and the other elves falls to earth. A while later, she wakes up in a panic and she has some kind of telepathy that lets her hear the other worried elves. They desperately want to know where the elder is, but she clams them down and tells everyone to gather for a meeting. Her name is Raren Rairu and she is told that her group has captured some humans. Look back at our group reveals that they haven't been able to contact Dante since the day before. It was pretty strange for him to charge into the forest so Kai assumes that he was instigated by someone. He predicts that Kuberi is an elven spy since elves can easily disguise themselves as humans by hiding their ears. There may be other elf spies in the army so Jean decides that they will have to investigate themselves. They eventually find the scene of a battle which makes it clear that Dante and the others fell for a trap. The trap seems pretty obvious because it's just a giant magic circle but Kai reveals that the real trap is above them. The trap is hard to see because of the sunlight but Kai has previous knowledge from his old world about how elves like to use multiple traps all at once. Just then Rinna whispers to Kai that she senses something nearby and she thinks it's an elf. They head in its direction and Kai tells the others that Rinna went through special training since magic. They arrive at the spot where the smell was coming from and they're all stunned as they are transported somewhere. Saki accused Ashurin getting a little handsy with her, but he points out that she used him as a landing pad. They seem to be in the elven forest and Kai explains that they just went through a celestial gate. Just then some strange girl appears and begs for Butterfly to be her friend. Fallon warns everyone to be careful because the girl is definitely a celestial and the girl went into Ashurin. He tries to ask her where she's from, but she just wonders why she doesn't sense any magic coming from him. Ashurin explains that just because they are humans, but this is means the girl run away out of fear that they will eat her alive. Our group follows her and they are met by archers. Kuberi appears to stop them from firing though, and she expresses her disbelief from them being able to activate the gate. Jean just how right calls her a spy and the demands to know Dante and the others are. Kuberi reveals that they are alive but they have inhaled the pollen from some paralysis plants so they won't be able to move for a few days. Jean demands that she release the hostages but Kuberi has a request first. She acknowledges that they defeated the hero of the demons so Kuberi asked them to fight the angels for her. Our group is shocked because they're both celestials, but Kuberi explains that the angels have betrayed them. Our group is taken to see Rerin, and she explains that they were the first humans to ever enter the elf village. Rerin can tell that Jean is wearing elven armor, so Jean experienced that she retrieved it after defeating some demons that stole it from celestials. Rerin let it slide because Jean didn't steal it from an elf herself, and she proposes a contract to them. Raren agrees to free the hostages, but in return she wants him to rescue the great elder from the celestial hero named Alfreya. Kai is familiar with the name, but Raren says that Alfreya has changed. He was always warm and gentle, but for some reason he demanded that elf dwarves and fairies become servants to the angels. Raren and the elder went to speak to him on behalf of the other celestials, but he refused to speak and Alfreya just captured the older. Raren will give them guidance on their journey, but will mainly be something they have to do themselves. Fallon wants proof that this isn't a trap because it would be big trouble for them if they end up getting ambushed by elves and angels. Kubri shocks everyone by saying that she will go with them and that they feel like something is wrong then they can end her life. 
Fallon rejects her offer and correctly points out to her single life is not worth six of their plus the lives of the hostages. Fallon insisted they put more lives on the line or offer the life that is far more valuable. Rarin is then the one to shock everyone once she offers her life. Kubri tries to stop her but it's too late as Rarin has already decided to accompany the humans. She wants to avoid civil war among the Celestials at all costs. So she tells the rest of their group not to take any action. She sends the dwarves and fairies back to their posts and everyone is shocked by how fast they move. Rarin has the girl named Silky. Bring some tulips so everyone takes a seat and listens to the details of her plan. That night, Rerun sees that Kai is not sleeping so she promises not to attack them when they're asleep. She won't make any moves while they're still under contract so Kai agrees to relax. Rerun was told that Kai and Rinne were the ones that defeated Vanessa. So she wonders if Kai's power will also work against the Lord of Heaven Alfreya. Rerun is sure that Kai will be the one who ends up fighting Alfreya. So if he can't win then everyone will just end up dying together. Rerun prepares to leave but she has one more thing to say. If Kai runs away out of fear during battle, then she will eliminate everyone he knows. Kai has a question for her and asked if she knows someone named Sid. Rerun doesn't so she just leaves. Kai thinks about how Vanessa seems to be the only one that knows about Sid. And he remembers how she told them to find the person behind the world's reincarnation. She was sure that it was one of the three other heroes so Kai eagerly wants to confront the hero of the Celestials, the Lord of Heaven Alfreya. The next morning, Rerun explains that the angel's palaces of some giant tree, there are a few floating fortresses, but she is sure that Alfreya isn't the one called the angel's palace. Kai is impressed by the measures taken to protect this palace, so he assumes that they did it as a countermeasure against humans. Rerun says that no one is afraid of humans, and the ones that are actually on alert for are demon spirits and mythical beasts. Rerun impressed by how fearless Kai is and he thinks about how he knows a man who faced all four heroes by himself. They teleport up to the palace and Rerun is shocked to see a bunch of lifeless bodies. Everyone is still alive but she still can't figure out who would do this to the angels. Kai doesn't know either but he points out that this works in their favor. They head further inside the palace and it becomes very clear to Jean that they would have had trouble navigating through it if Rerun didn't come along. After another teleportation our group must dodge an attack from someone that tells them that they stink. Rerun is stunned because this woman is known as War Angel Vicious. Vicious flings some insults at the elf and reveals that she was the one that attacked the angels at the entrance. Her reason was because they were disloyal fools who refused to obey Alfreya. Rerun is then horrified when Vicious declares that they will soon eliminate the elder as it will serve as a message to the elf's fairies and dwarves that messages just that they are inferior to the angels and they need to bow down. A fight breaks out as Fallon attracts the angel and Vicious is annoyed that Rerun brought humans to the sacred palace. Fallon tells Jean and Kai to go on ahead and she keeps Vicious from going after them. Rerun teleports the rest of our group further into the palace, but they were attacked by another angel. His name is Rafilo and Rerun fully expected to see him there. Rinna tells everyone to go on ahead and she promises not to lose against this giant tin can. Rafilo admires Rinna's sacrifice but Rinna says that she does not intend on losing. Up above Rerin goes around and doing several barriers that are protecting Alfreya. Jean reveals that she has been wanting to say something to Kai. So she apologizes for leaving him to fight Vanessa in their last battle. It was the most dangerous fight but this time she promises suffered alongside him. After removing the barriers, Rerin teleport them last time. They find their trapped elder and Alfreya appears before them. He mocks humans for having a wings and for only being able to look up at the heavens. Alfreya says that blessings come from the heavens but angels are the only ones entitled to receive them. Vicious continues to attack the others, but she is surprised to see that Fallon's sword was made from a drake's fong. It's an incredibly powerful weapon since its power erupts through impact. The celestial race is skilled at creating these types of magical items, so they know a lot about them. Vicious seems proud of that fact, but Fallon points out that her boss is trying to force slavery upon those very same Celestials. It doesn't make sense but Vicious says Alfreya's reason is just something humans can't fathom. Back with Rinna we see that she managed to do some damage to Raphael. He is surprised that she was able to pierce through his divine guard so easily, and he acknowledges her as a threat. Rinna can tell that he's just lying though, because in reality her attacks are doing nothing to him. She becomes frustrated by how calm Raphael is, and she laments how all angels look down on others. This is why the other races seem inferior to them, and Raphael wonders what Rinna is. Rinna explains that she doesn't know, but she doesn't want to know either, 
All that matters to her is that she stays by Kai's side. Back with Kai, we see Alfreya has decided that it's time for the execution of the Great Elder. Rerin is saddened by how much Alfreya has changed, but she must now tell him that he has no right to lead the Celestials. She must stop him so Rerin declares that she will send him to his grave. The others become worried when Alfreya summoned a powerful weapon to attack her, but Kai uses Code Holder to rescue her. Everyone is amazed by his heroics, and Alfreya wonders if Kai is really just a human. Kai confirms it, but Alfreya can't understand why human would defend an elf. Kai's response is simple. If something were to happen to Rerin, then the elves would resent him. Alfreya still can't understand, but he did notice the Kai sword is no ordinary weapon. Kai does some flexing and explains that his sword was able to rival Vanessa the demon hero. This means it also has the power to rival Alfreya. Alfreya has a good laugh at this declaration and he just mocks Vanessa for losing to a lowly human. Alfreya can't believe that Kai thinks so highly of himself, but Kai points out that Alfreya is in no position to call Vanessa a fool, mainly because she wasn't trying to execute her own subordinates like Alfreya is. Alfreya has a serious god complex as he states that anyone who disobeys him has no right to be his subordinate. Jean shocks everyone when they see that she has turned her weapon into a bow but her attack is easily stopped. Alfreya ends up taking damage from it, so he realizes that she's using an elven bow. Alfreya calls her the fool now, and he wonders if she knows what it means to wield an elven weapon with the human body. Jean of course does, but she just doesn't care that she's draining her own life away. Kai is stunned to hear this for the first time, but Jean says that there's no time to explain. Taking down Alfreya is what's most important. The annoyed Alfreya barely moves for his next powerful attack but he's surprised to see that Jean is also wearing elven armor. Alfreya is insulted by a human using celestial items, so he uses his little bell to summon another attack. Raren shows off a bit of her power with the protective barrier, and she declares that she refuses to be in debt to humans so many times. Kai thinks they need to free the Elder to make the fight more even, and Raren compliments him for being such a smart human. They rush towards the elderly so Alfreya tries to stop them, Rerun uses another barrier, but Alfreya destroys it, so Kai must block the attack with his sword. Alfreya has had enough of Kai, but Kai just tells him that he's taking humans too lightly. Rerun makes her heroic attempt to rescue the Elder, but her tiny useless dagger shatters into a million pieces. Rerun can't believe it because the dagger was elven treasure, the Elder is a being second only to heroes, so the cast could stealing her must be really powerful. All the items Alfreya is using are incredibly powerful as well, so she wonders how he can use all those magic items at once. Even as a hero, he should be depleting a lot of magic, he doesn't seem affected all though, so she wonders if this new power of his is what caused him to suddenly change. Alfreya doesn't answer and simply says that this is rapture, his change in personality is simply the joy he feels from finding a new subordinate to replace her. Everyone is then horrified when Alfreya opens a portal and he decides to show them his new subordinate. Kai can't believe his eyes, and Alfreya reveals that his subordinate is Last Riser. Back with Rinna, she has her hands full as she's getting destroyed by Raphael. Her wings are getting all messed up, but this just makes her angry, power bursts out of her body, and she lands a seriously powerful attack. Fallon continues her fight, and she instructs the humans to take out Vicious Wings. Their bullets missed by a long shot, but Ashurin manages to push her back with the grenade. Fallon uses the opportunity to stink up on Vicious, and she reveals that she knows her secret. Her wings are the source of all her power. Vicious can't believe that she knows her secret, and Fallon reveals that a man from another world told her about it. Back with Rinna, she is shocked when Raphael tells her to hurry up and move on ahead. He can tell that she's very powerful and with her abilities, she might be able to free the Great Elder. Raphael doesn't seem like such a bad guy, so Rinna wonders if he lost on purpose and he was just testing. Raphael explains that since the day Alfreya's personality changed, he and Vicious persevered and waited for this moment. He tells Rinna to leave already and we see that Vicious has surrendered. Fallon prepares to end her life, so Vicious wants Fallon to apologize to everyone for her. She is surprised though when Fallon says that she could tell that Vicious wasn't fighting seriously. Vicious took Fallon lightly by clashing blades with her when she could have been flying the entire time. The humans are then stunned when Fallon decides not to end her life. Up above, Alfreya orders Last Riser to attack. This attack is crazy powerful as it destroys everything in its path and it sends Jean flying. 
Jean somehow composes herself to launch a counterattack, but Last Riser defends herself. We see that Rene is the one that saved Jane's life, but she had to reveal her wings to do so. Jean wants a thorough explanation, but she decides that it can wait until after the battle. Alfreya calls Rene is a disgusting being, but Rene is more concerned about seeing Last Riser. Kai questions Alfreya about the world reincarnation, but he has no idea what Kai's talking about. Kai then asks about Sid, and this actually gets a reaction. Alfreya struggles with his memory, but he does seem to know about Prophet Sid. He begins to remember receiving something from that human, but Last Riser surprisingly attacks him. The robot monster has detected that Alfreya has been influenced by the taboo word Sid, so she must now execute zero code. She initiates the hero overwriting, which will remove Alfreya's code from the world. Everyone watches in horror as Alfreya screams in agony from being destroyed. Alfreya is eventually eliminated and everyone wonders what just happened. Kai remembers that this is what almost happened to Vanessa. Last Riser simply leaves and everyone questions if it's really over. Just then a power erupts out of nowhere and Alfreya reappears, but he's in a great deal of pain. Everyone tells Reiren to stay back, and she notices that Alfreya's wings have changed color. This thing is just an avatar of Alfreya, and he initiates the memories of the hero Celestial. Just then Kai members the when he was first teleported, a voice declared that the world was being overwritten. Now where Hero is being overwritten and it's causing a lot of problems. Alfreya about launches his first attack. Rinna struggles to hold it back. It eventually breaks through and the damage leaves everyone in really bad shape. Reiren is absolutely stunned because she realizes that Alfreya was able to use magic without channeling through magic items. Alfreya keeps talking about how he was gifted power by the heavens but Reirin tries to snap him out of his delusion. She says that he isn't enhancing his power, he is actually just chipping away at his life. Celestials take pride in using their items, but Alfreya has forgotten that and is taking the light and using magic without them. Alfreya tries to silence her, but Reirin says it's no match for her defense. Alfreya shocks her though by using a weapon to easily break through her shield. Kai rushes to rescue her and he scolds Alfreya for letting Reirin down, she never stopped hoping that he would return to normal, but Alfreya not interested in the fantasies of a weakling. Kai can tell that there's nothing left of the real Alfreya, but Alfreya says that a mere human could never understand. The one thing Kai does understand is that this Alfreya is only an imitation reproducing the hero's powers. And with that, we have come to the end of this part. Stay tuned for next part. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and activate the notification bell to receive all the latest updates.